let's have a look at residual income. We've seen uh, what ROI can do, and we've seen sort of the drawback of ROI as a decision-making criteria. So let's see if residual income overcomes that shortcoming. And residual income, for those of you who've taken microeconomics before, the concept of economic profit. This is pretty much what we're looking at when we look at residual income. The accounting term is called residual income. In economics, we would call it economic profit. And what it is, it's our operating income minus our average operating assets times the minimum required rate of return. So what it's saying here is that if we require a 10% return minimum for any investment in assets, we take our average operating assets times the 0.1 times 10%, and our operating income should be at least that. So if residual income is zero, that means economic profit is zero. We're in a perfectly competitive economy or perfectly competitive industry in that particular case. What we want is positive residual income, which is the same as positive economic profit. Again, I'm using both terms. For those of you who've taken microeconomics, this will, if you understand economic profit, that's residual income. For those who haven't got an economics background, <clears throat> don't worry too much about it. Let's look at an example. So rather than maximizing ROI, our goal is to maximize residual income. So let's have an example here. Let's say we have average operating assets of 100,000, operating income of 20,000, and our required rate of return, our minimum required rate of return, rather than write it out each time, notice what I'm doing here, that's all I'm doing, is 15%. So if we were gonna calculate an ROI, our return on investment, we would have 20,000 over 100,000, and these are dollar signs, which would give us a 20% ROI. And if we were gonna calculate residual income, we would take our operating income minus our required rate of return on assets. We have average operating assets of 100,000 times 0.15, 15%. We can see that that's 15,000, so our residual income is $5,000. In other words, we're earning more than the re minimum required rate of return the project is returning more, hence it's a go. And we have a 20% ROI. Well, let's just see what happens when we add $25,000 to our operating assets, but the addition of that $25,000 will also add 4.5,000 or 4.5,000 to our operating income. So let's calculate our new ROI. Our new ROI now is not 20,000, but it's 24.5. 24.5, and our assets are not 100, but they're now 125, 125K, which will give us 19.6% ROI. We have a drop in ROI from 20% to 19.6. So the manager assessing this, if they're rewarded an ROI, would say that would hurt my ROI. But let's look at it from a residual income perspective. We have a new income now of 24,500, but we have to cover off our minimum required rate of return. Let's see if we can do that. 125 times 0.15% or times, sorry, times 0.15 or 15%. And if you do the math on that, you will get $5,750, 5.75K. So our residual income has increased. So from an ROI perspective, we don't like it. From a residual income perspective, we like it because remember, the goal is to maximize our residual income. That maximizes. We would have a go decision here. We would have a no go decision here. So which one rules the day, right? So we have a reject. And here we have an accept. In fact, you could take this a little bit further. The manager rewarded on RI would reject anything, would reject anything below 20%. So in other words, the minimum required rate of return is 15, but for a manager who has a 20% ROI now, would reject any new project where the ROI would be below 20%, would reject anything below 20%. Whereas here it's accepted, this manager is likely to accept anything above 
the required rate of return, the minimum, M-I-N, minimum required rate of return, which is 15%. So anything above 15% will be accepted, whereas this manager, anything below 20 will be rejected. So that is what residual income looks like. And again, if you've taken microeconomics, the concept of economic profit is right there. However, residual income is not without its problems. Let's have a look at what that looks like. So have a look at this. We have two divisions, division X and division Y. <clears throat> division X has average operating assets of a million, whereas Y is only 250,000. Operating income in X is 120 versus Y is 40. The required rate of return is 10%. That's our minimum required rate of return. On a million dollars of assets, we need to make at least 100,000. We have 120 minus 100. We have 20,000 in residual income. Division Y has 25,000 as a minimum required rate of return. 10% of our average operating assets of 250 is 25, which leaves them with 15,000 in residual income. So if we were comparing the divisions on residual income, we would say Division X has the higher level of residual income. But, <clears throat> now this is not in your book, but this is one way to help you control for size. Let's have a look here. If we take our residual income divided by our operating income, so let's take this ratio of residual income divided by operating income. In other words, what percentage of our operating income is actually residual? So we would have 20K over 120K here, giving us 16.67%. So our residual income divided by operating income, or what we can call our residual income margin, is 16.67%. Here, we have 15,000 as our residual margin, over 40,000, which would give us 375 sorry, not K, sorry, 37.5%. So our residual income margin is now 37.5%, thereby making division Y far more efficient because there's a greater percentage of the operating income that is residual income. Another way of doing this, <clears throat> let's take our residual income and divide it by our average operating assets. And here we will get 20,000 divided by, we have 1 million, gives us 2%. So our residual income is only 2% of our average operating assets. But over here, we have 15,000 divided by 250,000. And that will give us 6%. Again, division Y appears to win. So once we control for the size of the assets, we control for it by stating residual income as a percentage of it, we find that division Y is better. When we control for the level of operating income, we find that division Y is better. But when we just look at residual income on its own, we find that division X is better. And this is a bit of a problem with residual income. It is hard to compare divisions of different size together on the basis of residual income. It's much easier to look at it as margins, residual income as a ratio to average operating assets or residual income as a residual income margin, residual income divided by operating income. We can clearly see that division Y is smaller, that if division Y were four times bigger in assets, this 15 might be four times bigger, might be 60,000 in residual income rather than 20, making division Y three times more profitable on a residual income basis. And we can see that uh, expressed as a percentage of operating assets, division Y is three times better uh, than division X in terms of, re uh, of, of residual income stated as a return on average operating assets. So we can state a couple of rules here. Residual income for department X is greater than residual income for department Y due simply to size. So while you can compare ROI again for division Y and division X, you can use ROI regardless of the size of the company. Regardless of the size of the company, it's comparable across all sizes 
residual income is not comparable across all sizes. And we find that residual income for y is greater than the residual income for x once we start controlling for size. So keep that in mind. If you're comparing two divisions and one is significantly larger asset-wise than another one, it will appear to have more residual income because it's just a bigger department. Now, that's not always the case. That may not always be the rule. It's just that when we are looking at two divisions that are different in size, we cannot automatically assume that that one division is better than another simply because the residual income is higher. That extra residual income could just be a function of their size. Once we control for size, whether we control for size by taking a ratio of residual income to the operating income or taking a ratio of the residual income to the average operating assets, we see that, well, not really. That's not the case. Now, it might be the case. It just might be the case that division X ends up having better ratios, but you don't know until you actually do it. So there's the one drawback with residual income. Comparisons across divisions of different size become problematic unless you control for size and state them as ratios. Then that problem goes away. So it's not really a problem. It's a problem in this form, but it's not a problem in this form. There's residual income.